Hey, welcome back to Past Gas. This week we're talking about a very cool topic. Spoon and Mugen, you know them. Legendary Honda tuners. If uh, you're a longtime donut fan, you know we've told these stories on Up to Speed, but today we get to tell them in much more depth. Really cool stuff. Some amazing Civics and S2000s and SXs, even some motocross bikes in this episode. Uh, here we go. Is Ice Spice a Dune reference? Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> wow. Ice Spice, the She's like, shouts out Ben and Jezzeret, yeah. bitch. Florence Pugue is in the new one. That's I cool. don't like her. Why not? I don't get it. Hmm. Did you see Midsommar? Yeah. yeah. I love Midsommar, dude. Yeah. I thought I saw her on Main Street in Santa Monica. Yeah, it's just another person with short arms. Yeah. Oh, she does have short <laughs> arms. <laughs> The difference between, like, me and Emily are kind of the same height, but I have the longest torso in the world, I guess. Cause yeah. She, Let's I have get a torso off car. after this. Oh, yeah. yeah. She, I guess I got short legs and long what's torso your, what's because your, I get in her car and I can't even reach the pedals. Oh, yeah. man. I bet that's yeah. the I do that with yeah. every car here. Really? Everyone, yeah. Anytime. Jerry. You're in a car. Yeah. Job. Jerry. You got long legs. I'm like, I got long legs. I think as tall or taller than Job. But he's Job. Says, yeah. <laughs> Don't let so. him hear you say that. Yeah. We got some long leg boy. What's your pant leg size? 30. 30? And like, it's kind of like I maybe should do 29. Oh, wow. And really? you're like, we're the I'm same. I wear, I wear 30s, but I like my pants to be like really short. My mom called that floods. Yeah, I floods. Because yeah. Johnny Knoxville does it. That's oh, why. I I've been doing that since I was a kid. I see. That's Johnny Knoxville is my hero. Yeah. Guys will literally design pants uh, <laughs> to deal with floods instead of dealing with the climate change. <laughs> nice. Nice, dude. <laughs> In the world of Honda tuning, two names, strange as they may be, are often at the top of the list. These companies upended the racing world with their attention to detail and refusal to accept anything but the best in terms of power, precision, and of course, speed. But the road to success is anything but smooth. Both had to overcome major setbacks and hurdles to earn their spot at the top. These disruptors are often thought of as overnight successes in the racing world. But if we look a little closer, we can see that they both face decades of turbulence, legal trouble, and challenges that go beyond what they put under the hood. In this episode, we take a look at Spoon and Mugen. How did these companies start? How have they evolved over the years to stay on top? And what are their plans for the future? And where did they get the name Spoon from anyway? Use that to put food in your mouth. Grab your racing helmet, get your laptop, and let's wake up the neighbors at 3 a.m. Because today on Pass Gas, we're stepping back in time to talk tuners. This is the stories of Spoon and Mugen. Spoon and Mugen, not a media <laughs> stand from Ikea. No. Uh, spoon and Mugen. Spoon, spoon and Mugen. <laughs> oh, a little Spoon and Mugen. And There's been a lot really of hungry. discussion over the years of how to properly pronounce the word Mugen. Yeah. And the founder of Mugen came out with a video, and it is Mugen, not Mugen. It's a correct pronunciation. It's Mugen, not Mugen. Mugen is really, really uncool. Mugen, Very like a cow cool. goes Mugen. I almost messed it up doing the intro. You I almost did. Felt a little bit of my mouth going. Meep. It's like yeah. the fixation thing where you're trying to avoid yeah. an obstacle Target and you're like, ah, yeah. Do that a lot on this show. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So both these stories have a great intertwining timeline. That's where yeah. we're telling them together. First, let's welcome everybody to the show here first. Okay. My yeah. name is Nolan Sykes. Welcome to Pass Gas, everybody. The person you hear possibly <laughs> sneezing across from me is James Pumphrey. How are you? We're in hot soup now. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Joe Weber, what's up, dude? Oh, uh, spoon forks. Sp <laughs> and we are talking spoon and Mugen today. Spoon and Mugen. Before I moved to Los Angeles, before I moved down here, uh, growing up in Central California, I mean, I was like only interested in muscle cars. Yeah. And you know what? I still am. I love 
cars of that era, the 60s and 70s, still very into them. But since working here and since doing a lot of videos in the past like two years, I think, specific to Civics. I like think I did, saw the change happen in you when we did we drove every Civic. Absolutely, yeah. I saw it physically happen. Oh, yeah. You were like, this yeah. is sick. They just made so much sense. And like feeling that VTEC in a lot of them and just feeling the care and everything that went into those into the Civics themselves. Like, I mean, they're just such great cars. It's so cool. I'm definitely like on a major Civic kick right now, especially yeah. after we did the, the K20 swap on our EG Civic. If you haven't seen that yet on YouTube, definitely check it out. It was a lot of fun. Go check it. Uh, we, check it we got out. some more videos coming on the EG, so h hang in there. But I mean, that... All that being said, I'm like very excited to talk about these companies today. I want an EF Civic. I'm gonna I'm gonna get one, an EF hatch. But then I also wanna get the SI, Civic yeah. SI. Get one of those, real nice one. You're Not real get, nice, you're but so I'm so into civics, you want two civics. Yeah. Yeah. You've right. driven the same car for the past like thirteen years and now you're gonna buy <laughs> two civic hatchbacks. Well the, the <laughs> EA, the the S I, the EA S I, that's that'll be down the line. I wanna get one that's like not too uh -huh. Not super pristine that I'd yeah. feel bad about modifying it. I uh -huh. want to get one that has some issues here and there so I can get some Mugen parts yeah. and do the whole catalog on hey, it. Hey, good luck finding one with the issues. It's a Honda. Or <laughs> nice. So I, uh, what, what's your guys' uh, kind of uh, experience, view, feelings towards these two uh, companies? I've right? always liked Hondas. I've always liked hot Hondas, yeah. little hot roddy mm -hmm. front-wheel drive cars. I think uh, I came up at when in like the first, or not the first, but like when I was a kid, my dad still thought Hondas were dumb. Mm -hmm. Like, and you can't go fast in front wheel drive. Turns out you can. <laughs> Turns out you can go pretty dang fast. Yeah. I don't know fail wheel drive. And uh, Spoon and Mugen parts have Spoon just always been grail. Mm -hmm. Just the yeah. uh, grail, grail status stuff. So when we put. Speaking of our EG hatch, we put mm -hmm. spoon calipers on it. Mm -hmm. Those were like, Those whoa, are expensive. we've arrived. Yeah, we have cool. like the unobtainable parts from Japan. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, I, what about you? The car that I learned to drive in was mm -hmm. a an, spoon uh, <laughs> race car. Yeah. And uh, they said, whoa, you're so good. Do you just want to skip the license and go straight to super license? And yeah. I said, yes. <laughs> no, but... Uh, I learned on my friend's uh, 88 CRX. Oh, nice. And I loved it. But then my first, like, introduction to Spoon was the Spoon S2000 in Gran Turismo. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the yeah. Yellow, and ye uh, mm -hmm. yellow and blue scheme. Uh, in Gran Turismo 4. And I was like, oh, this must be a cool company. It's yeah. a weird name for a company, but I love it. Before we get to Spoon and Mugen, we have to talk about Honda. The Honda Motor Company was founded in Japan in 1948 by one Soichiro Honda. One of the coolest guys in car history. Yes, we've talked about Made him motorcycles, made sick little cars. Made took, whiskey. Yeah, took oh, a year off because he was sick of it and just yeah. went into the mountains and brewed his own whiskey. I wonder if there's still bottles of that. Dude. Shoot, dude. What a great present to give people. That's mm. grilled. That's, that's grail, dude. That's almost as grailed as spoon calipers <laughs> or that Mugen valve cover. So Ichiro brought his unique vision to the world of motorcycles and eventually automobiles. And whiskey. And whiskey. But in addition to creating one of his most recognizable brands in motorsports, Soichiro also created a bouncing baby boy. <laughs> yeah. Hirotoshi Honda was born in 1942 and grew up in a household surrounded by fast cars and precision motorcycles. As Hirotoshi came of age, Soichiro... And, and whiskey. <laughs> Soichiro knew he would eventually face a dilemma. He had seen the sons of other successful businessmen fail once they inherited their father's companies, and Soichiro was a bit worried. In his own words, quote, No matter how outstanding the founder of a company may be, there is no guarantee that his son is equally capable. The corporate presidency must be handed over to a person possessing the most distinguished qualities of leadership. Dad, I mean, I'm right here. <laughs> I'm not Ford. <laughs> <laughs> this assessment is pretty harsh, but also fair. Hirotoshi didn't mind, though. He enrolled at the Nihon University in Tokyo and enjoyed his carefree life. When asked about his father's wishes to keep him out of the family business, Hirotoshi said, quote, I don't think about my position. I just don't care about it. I was brought up not to expect a place in my father's company when I was young. He had seen other sons become big failures in their family's businesses and didn't want that to happen to us. This was lucky 
because I didn't want to join the company anyway. <laughs> I wanted to travel, and I did. My father had followed his own dream and taught me about a little thing that we like to call freedom. In fact, the only Honda products Hirotoshi owns to this day are a lawnmower and a monkey bike. That a monkey is bike. crazy. Uh, a little mini bike. He doesn't own a single Honda car. No, I guess not. He builds spoon. He builds <laughs> them. Or is Mugen Fair. Is, this is Fair. cute. This the Honda Z monkey bike is really dude. Cute. Monkey bikes are cool. Monkey yeah. bike. Monkey bike. Spoon and Mugen monkey bike. Spoon and Mugen monkey bike. <laughs> so. <laughs> So, Suichiro continued to lead the Honda revolution, and Hirotoshi continued to study and travel the world. During his travels to Italy, Hirotoshi fell in love with Italian design and visited designers Pininfarina, Bertone, and Giugiaro, and even became buddies with the king of style himself, Enzo Ferrari. The king of style? Yeah, he's got jackets. Have you seen those Ferrari <laughs> jackets on the website? They don't really uh, Those are sick. <laughs> And he designed every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Before he died. And make it the more red. I'm almost done with the 47 years of uh, design catalogs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this one will be released in the spring of 2024. <laughs> <laughs> make it look like a baseball jacket, <laughs> but a red with a big horse on it. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is just <laughs> Yeah, we're gonna put a horse on it <laughs> <laughs> uh, Soon after meeting the king of style Ferrari Hirotoshi started tinkering in his own garage And managed to build a Honda S800 powered sports car Of his own design Between traveling and finishing up classes at university Does that mean it's an uh, Like I think it's got 800 the cc No, no, the S800 was like a little roadster uh, but I'm, it probably was 800 cc. It's if probably the S S2000 probably. is uh, two. Okay, two I get it. Yeah, and the S800 is sort of like a predecessor to the S2000, Nolan. Oh. Yeah, it's not. Oh, it's like you haven't even read oh. anything about Honda ever. Oh, yeah, it's shoot. like you have your head oh. <laughs> permanently implanted into your tuck. It's so warm in here. <laughs> um, despite his best efforts, Hirotoshi had been bitten by the car building bug, and it wasn't long before he decided to start his own company. Real quick, at Supercar Sunday a couple months ago, I saw an S800. This guy put a Mitsubishi 4G. 63 in it? Yeah. Oh, Whoa, wow. With a turbo. weird choice. I know, but he said it was... Was it all-wheel drive? No, just uh, rear-wheel drive, and he said it was yikes. the scariest car he's ever driven. I bet, <laughs> dude. Yeah. I bet that we would look like Donkey Kong. Yeah. Especially with your long torso. Just oh, popping straight right. out. Yeah, I was sitting in the Corvette yesterday, and I had to sit like this. Damn. That sucks. Yeah. For our listeners listening in the car, Joe is all scrunched up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so in 1973, Mugen, which means limitless, infinite, and immense, nice. opened its doors to make special parts for motocross bikes. So in 1973, that same year, uh, Soichiro Honda and his business partner, Takeo Fujisawa, retired and left Honda in the hands of non-familial corporate managers. Ugh. Yeah. But Hirotoshi enlisted the help of a number of Honda's R&D employees to fill out the Mugen team, and this included Masao Kimura, who became chief designer and mechanic. Kimura was a world-renowned sports car and single-seat racer with over 50 race wins under his belt. Holy heck, dude. He also built over 15 different race cars and motorcycles while working for Honda. His presence gave Mugen some much-needed street cred. Mugen. And, did I say Mugen? You said it the uncool way. S that is Smack so it. uncool. No, no. Someone hurt me. Oh, <laughs> hurt yourself? No, I do already. I slap my heart. All right, to do uh, it. that's a one. That's one uncool. Yeah, you do way. three uncools, and, and you owe us a dollar. Uh oh. Yeah. Okay. His presence gave Mugen some much-needed street cred and gave Hirotoshi the confidence to take his new company to the next level. Dude, how have I not heard of this Kimura guy? This is this. It's dope. With all the pieces in place, Hiratoshi was ready to make his mark on the racing world. But where to start? Hmm. One fateful day, he pulled some strings and hmm. bought a 1.2 liter four-cylinder engine to the Mugen shop. Hiratoshi and his team were able to turn this unassuming engine into a fearsome 1.3 liter, 135 horsepower engine that became known as the MF318. That's kind of a lot for back then. Yeah. 
MF standing for MFers don't F with it. Uh, and 318 is John 318 John from the Bible. From the Do Bible. not <laughs> with Christ. <laughs> <laughs> this engine had a dry sump lubrication system, dual carbs, and was bored out to 1300 cc's. So it was 1.3 liters before. Oh, 1.2 liters. Yeah. Now it's 1300. The Mugen team decided to place this beast under the hood of a Honda Civic EB1. Hmm. So that's the first gen. Yeah. We drove one. Yeah. The when it was the CVCC. Oh, yes. Yeah. So it's the CVCC Civic, the cutie. Yeah. The little, little cutie yellow. patootie. The little, 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 little cutie patootie. <laughs> they also tuned up the rest of the EB1, Dang. modifying the stock parts to com- or completely remaking them in-house. Dude, Dude I would, this is grail. This thing would, would probably thing. go so hard. Dude, yeah. for sure. Oh, my God. I want to drive this. Yeah. Because it the like Civic didn't hit 135 horsepower probably till late 90s. It took a while. This 1300cc engine EB1 became a calling card for Mugen. And the team entered their creation into the 1973 Formula FJ 1300 Racing Series with their reputation on the line. Aha, we got our MF318 Civic EB1. We're going to put it in the FJ uh, 1300 Series. Really rolls off the tongue. Yeah. Once (laughs) the race began, the Mugen team looked on nervously and won. Oh. This victory solidified <laughs> Mugen as a disruptor in the racing world, my favorite word, yeah. and a force to be reckoned with in future races. The Honda team knew Mugen would be a fierce competitor moving forward and decided it might be a good idea to work with them rather than against them. If you can't beat them, join them. If you can't beat them, join them, especially if their dad started your company. <laughs> yeah. The Honda company had been on a racing hiatus for a bit, but saw Mugen as a way to get back onto the track. Mugen then began working exclusively with Honda Motorsports. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's cool. Coincidentally. <laughs> Funny how that worked out. Yeah. <laughs> After a couple years of... It's like Paris Hilton, coincidentally, only stayed as at Hilton Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> After a couple years of selling only engines, Mugen decided it was time to branch out a bit. In 1975, they began selling exhausts, spoilers, wheels, and even their first line of body kits. Oh, I gotta yeah. know what this looks like. I know. <laughs> I know. This gave the everyday Civic owner a chance to give their regular point A to point B yeah. Civic that signature racer look. So cool. Now, money was pouring in from the F8 MF318 engine, and Hirotoshi was ready to expand his company's reach into the wild world of motocross so with the wind in their sails mugen began working on their own custom two-stroke dirt bikes the me 125 and the me 250 based on the cr 250 elsinore the me 250 had a modified frame with engine and suspension components Hmm. okay it's not quite what we're uh thinking what we think of mugen motocross stuff but it's still interesting once the tinkering was uh actually it is what should think of when you think Mugen. I am going to start now. Yeah. Uh, Johnny Dirt Bike race for Mugen. Johnny Dirt Bike? Yeah, I think so. Old Johnny <laughs> Dirt Bike, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Once the tinkering was complete, team Old Johnny Dirt Bike. Old nuts, Johnny Dirt Bike. Him. Once the tinkering was complete, Team Mugen entered their ME250 bike in the final race of the 1976 All Japan Motocross <laughs> Nationals at the Japanese Grand Prix. They wanted to see how their bikes stacked up against motocross veterans like Suzuki, Yamaha, and Daddy's Mommy's Honda itself. <laughs> to many people's surprise, they won. Oh, okay. Baby. Mugen's racing footprint kept getting bigger and bigger, and the demand for Mugen parts and services was growing. By 1979, they were feeling pretty flush and opened their own factory in Japan, obviously. But Hiratoshi knew in order to have his dream fully realized... He'd have to expand his operations. Wow, wow, wow. Westward. <laughs> oh, I just understood what you tried to do. Oh, like a little. Like, wow, wow, wow. A little oh, Ennio oh, Maraconi. Oh, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> that just sounds wow, like. Wow, 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 wow. wow, wow, wow. I couldn't figure out if you were doing wow, the Western wow. theme or a Japanese cat. 
Would you be impressed if I was doing both? Yeah. <laughs> Johnny <laughs> Dirtbike? Johnny Dirtbike. Is so handsome. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Is this a real guy? Yes. Yeah, look him up. Yeah. <laughs> He's doing it. He's typing. All right, so by 1980, Hiratoshi had his own motocross team. Having proved themselves in the motocross world domestically, Mugen set their sights on the untapped U.S. market. But how? How do you infiltrate the already booming motocross industry in a country so far away? Wait, okay, it can't be untapped and also booming. It's untapped for Mugen. Untapped for Mugen and also booming. <laughs> the answer to those questions, Joe... Yeah. Was a little man named Johnny O'Mara. Is this dirt Johnny bike Johnny? Dirt Bike. <laughs> oh my God. A native Californian. Johnny O'Mara was the complete embodiment of U.S. motorsport. His dad was an avid desert racer, and O'Mara started riding with his family on the weekends at an early age. And his mom was Sally Carrera. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. By the time he was 10 years old, Omara had become involved in the ever-growing SoCal racing scene of the 1970s. Also got to remember that dirt bikes at the time were, like, extremely heavy, mm -hmm. and their suspension sucked compared yeah. to what it is today. So oh, yeah, for these sure. huge bikes, these dudes are flying over jump still. It's so impressive. I just want to clock that you guys didn't think I was serious when I said Johnny Dirtbike rode for Mugen, and I knew about Mugen. Mugen. No. Uh. <laughs> Smack him, Joe. <laughs> Got his ass. <laughs> <laughs> we can't collectively get more than three slides. I know. Otherwise, we have to We're quit the show. Yeah. yeah, we have to quit the show and then hand it over to somebody else. Omara admits his early racing days were a little rough, saying, quote, remember, he's from California in the 70s. <laughs> I wasn't very good. <laughs> I rode a 100cc bike that was really too small to race. <laughs> They had to put a milk crate next to the bike so I could even get on, dude. Even <laughs> though I didn't do very well at first, I liked the feeling of being around the races, dude. So, like, I was like, yeah. <laughs> but by the time 1980 rolled around, Omara was coming into his own as a racer. Hiratoshi felt the young hotshot was the perfect person to bring the Mugen brand across the Pacific. Mugen hand-built Omara a custom red, white, and blue ME125 for his entry in the 125cc U.S. Grand Prix at Mid Ohio, been of all there. Places. You've been there. No, you didn't. Go. I didn't go to that. Uh, to the surprise of many, an American spectator, Omara won the race and solidified Mugen as a brand to watch. That was the victory that helped me make my mark in the sport. Omara says, <laughs> "I broke my back in a car accident, so I missed a bunch of the nationals that year, and that race proved that I was back." And healthy again, and it probably helped me get the factory Honda ride in 1981, <laughs> even though with Mugen, I was already pretty much as close to a Honda factory rider as you could get. I was so close, all I had to do is take the 405 down to the 101. <laughs> Omara's red, white, and blue bike was so iconic that Mugen decided to produce the bike en masse and make it available for consumer purchase. For a cool four thousand dollars, which works out to fourteen k today, no That's way! That's an expensive insane. ring ring bike. That's a lot. This yeah. further cemented the Mugen brand in the eyes of everyday Americans. Hiratoshi's plan to disrupt the United States motocross scene it was coming to fruition. He's such a disruptor. I know, dude. Fruition actually is a very good word. I love fruition. I love fruits. Just had a banana before we started recording. Seizing on the popularity of Mugen in motocross, Hiratoshi wanted to make Mugen's Civic upgrades available for purchase in the U.S. as well. The Civic was seen, for the most part, as a commuter car in the States. Well, it got really great gas mileage. Didn't mm -hmm. need a catalytic converter. That was, was the tiny. idea. It was great. But by 1984, you could order things like Mugen body kits, wheels, or suspension from your local American Honda dealership. Wow. That's sick as hell, sick dude. Sick as hell, dude. Add it to the time machine list. Yeah. 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 Go back, get some of those freaking body kits. Yeah. Put those in a barn somewhere. Put those in a barn somewhere with yeah. my Bitcoins yeah. and my iPhone 1s in yeah. the original package. Guys, if you see a hard drive with my name on it lying around this office, I lost $1.2 billion, <laughs> and I can't find if it. If I cash it, out, it will crash the U.S. economy. <laughs> uh, you think you got problems? Four of my apes were stolen. <laughs> <laughs> Mugen fever was sweeping the nation. In 1984, Mugen began building their GT4 CRX Civic 
to compete in the SCCA National Championships. Yes. And I know before clicking this link that this thing's going to be sick yeah. as hell. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. This car was designed by the Special Projects Division of American Honda in Gardena, California. Pretty close to here, actually. Dude, the team rules. The team was led by Dix Erickson, Charlie Kernut. Shut up. And Dix Erickson and Charlie yeah. Kernut. Yep. It and sounds- Mugen lead engineer Takashi Uno. Uh, get all the yeah. boys together. Get Dick. Get Kernut. <laughs> we're making some. We're gonna design some stuff. Your name's Dick. No, plural Dicks. <laughs> <laughs> His name is probably Dixon Erickson. That's well, a bad name. Dix Erickson. Charlie, Charlie Kernut. Kernut. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite skaters is named Hayden Brobin. <laughs> <laughs> Hayden Brobin. <laughs> They took the 1.5 liter EW motor and brought it from a stock 76 horsepower to an astounding Get guys. Get out of my 165 face! 165 horsepower. Oh, man. In That's that tiny double. little bucket. That's insane. I bet that little bucket screamed. <laughs> <Yeah, dude. laughs> this thing's sick. The engine included that dry sump lubrication system. Well, yeah. And twin 45 deco Weber carburetors on a oh. Mugen intake manifold. The car also had a close ratio five-speed transmission, which was also designed by Mugen. This thing was a little monster. Little monster. Don't look under your bed or you'll see the Mugen CRX. That's so cool, dude. Mom, the the Mugen GT4 CRX is under my bed. Little Monster starring Fred Savage. (laughs) It's a movie I watched probably 175 times when I was a kid. Is there a blue guy in it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is there a blue guy in it? And yeah, he's like, come on, let's go down to my world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the movie. <laughs> in May of 1985, that CRX won its first race at Road Atlanta. But rather than rest on their laurels, guys, the team refined the gearing, the exhaust systems, brakes, wheels, and suspension. Racer Doug Peterson ended up winning the 1985 National Championship in the GT4 class, driving the CRX, the little monster. The following year, driver Parker Johnstone once more drove the Mugen CRX to victory. But dominating FJ1300 and SCCA GT4 races can be so boring. Yeah. So Mugen expanded into Formula car racing, starting with feeder F3 cars. Whoa. They went into the F3000 series which was the top level of single-seater racing in Japan. The F3 motors Mugen modified were the B20A. Okay. Holy moly. The same motor found in the second-gen Prelude. That's cool. I did not know that. That's so sick. That's really rad. I want a third-gen Prelude. But because Mugen put their hands on these little motors, they named them the Mugen MF204. As in MFers better not. Yeah. yeah. It's around with us 24-7. Yeah. <laughs> 204. 204. Uh, it was a two liter, 16 valve, four banger thrown into that Formula 3 chassis, as I mentioned. That's that so would have been so heck, fun dude. to drive. <laughs> That's is what it sounds like. Mugen won three consecutive F3 Constructors Championships. Whoa. That's sick. And dozens of races in the European arm of the F3 series. Come on, son. They still have a stake in the Formula 3 circuit. And since 1988, they have nine titles in Asia, 19 titles in Europe, and 13 in Latin America. Wow. I did not I'd, know that. I had no idea. I had no idea. Come see my world. <laughs> <laughs> Mugen was proving that they really were limitless. The future looked bright, but unbeknownst to them, another Honda tuning company was about to explode onto the racing scene. Big thank you to our sponsor this week, Rocket Money. This is a product I've actually used, and guess what? I had a few subscriptions that I'd forgot about. I think I was paying like 65 bucks for things I wasn't even using. And thanks to Rocket Money, I was able to cancel those subscriptions. And guess what? They also will go to bat for you. You tell them that there's a service you're paying for. In my case, it was my internet cable bill. They will actually negotiate a better rate for you, and then you just give them a little slice of that savings, and that's it. That's all you got to do and then you don't have to pay a crazy bill every month i actually did that and they saved me like 30 bucks on my internet bill it's insane so let me tell you what rocket money even is rocket money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions it monitors your spending and helps you lower your bills all in one place most people think they're spending 80 bucks on their subscriptions when in reality the number is closer to 200 bucks stop wasting money on things you don't use cancel your unwanted subscriptions and manage your money the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com gas 
it works just as advertised. That's rocketmoney.com slash gas, rocketmoney.com slash gas. This episode of Past Gas is sponsored by BetterHelp. You know, sometimes in life we're faced with tough choices and the path forward isn't always clear. It's not always super easy to figure out what your next move should be. Whether you're dealing with decisions around a career, relationship, or anything else, therapy helps you stay connected to what you really want while you navigate life so you can move forward with confidence and excitement. Trusting yourself to make decisions that align with your values is like anything else. The more you practice it, the easier it gets. And that's why I'm stoked to be working with BetterHelp because their therapists can help you navigate life. Therapy is super great. It's helpful for learning positive coping skills, how to set boundaries, empowers you to be the best version of yourself. If you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. Let therapy be your roadmap with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash past gas today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash past gas. Thank you so much, BetterHelp. Japanese racer Tatsuru Ichishima wanted to build a race car of his own. And in 1985, when he was 33, Christ year, he founded the <laughs> Tatsuro Ichishima Company. Cool. Yeah. I mean, not very original. <laughs> uh, that last name means number one island. Ichishima. Nice. <laughs> Sick. Uh, with the intention of doing just that. Ichishima was a renowned racer and was able to gain support from both Mugen and Honda for his build's necessary parts. In exchange for these parts, Ichishima agreed to provide racing data to Mugen and Honda. This was a rare compromise in the racing world. In fact, Ichishima only realized years later just how special this deal was, saying, I used to be a test driver for Honda. Back then, getting the support from the manufacturers was huge but I didn't realize just how special that was until later. At that time, all I wanted to do was race. In 1988, the Tatsura Ichishima Company changed its name to Spoon Sports. Uh. Heck yeah, dude. Much to this podcaster's Relief. (laughs) (laughs) Boo. The name taken from a difficult turn on the Suzuka circuit. Of course. It's all coming together. Whoa. That's cool. Yeah. Corkscrew racing. Corkscrew. That's pretty good. Uh, It's it's all right. We'll work on it. Uh, I don't know any other corners uh, of American Oh, Oh, Rouge. Oh, that's got to be taken. Yeah. That's got to be taken. Yeah, what's another one? Scary downhill left-hander at <laughs> Streets of Willow Racing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Carousel at Nürburgring. Carousel. Okay, of course, yeah. yeah. Valigare. Hmm. Porsche Curves. Hmm. That's at VRR, right? <laughs> Porsche no, Racing. That's at uh, Cirque de la Sarthe. Oh. oh. I really messed right. that up. Last corner at Scuba. Last corner racing is kind of sick. Last corner. Forest elbow racing. Forest elbow. Yeah. I got a foresty elbow right here, dude. Yeah. Hey, you rouge. should um, moisturize right, that so elbow. I mean, None of these are as good as spoon. Know, there are little None of these are as good as spoon, guys. Let's pack it up. Casino motorsport would be cool, too. Casino motorsport sounds shady. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gamble with your the <laughs> quality of the uh, products. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the spoon comes from... A difficult turn at the Suzuka circuit. With the Mugen and Honda deal in place, Spoon Sports began working on their first build, a 1985 Civic Hatchback EAAT. Dude, this thing... That thing's sick. It's so cool. Yeah. Ichishima ripped out any and every creature comfort for weight reduction, much like I am doing in my in my life right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he gave it Showa suspension, Nissan brakes, uh, the brake calipers that we were talking about, Earlier, the Grail items that are on our Civic are still made by Nissan. That's sweet. And tuned the 1.6 liter ZC engine, which we were talking about Ooh. yesterday, Nolan. Oh. Legendary oh. engine. My yep. friend Raymer in high school, probably shouts to him, but he's probably dead, uh, <laughs> had one in an EF hatch. Raymer also got arrested while driving my car. Oh. 
ZC engine. This thing's so sick. Until it put out a whopping 230 horsepower. 230. That's 100 more horsepowers than stock. From like a single cam. Yeah, non VTEC. Wow. Rip. So nutty, dude. So the ZC engine is a Civic engine, the stock mm -hmm. Civic engine. There's a really good video clip of this car with this engine. Gavin, I will send it to you and we'll put a little rev sound right here. That sounds so sick. Uh huh. Uh, it's a little monster. So, yeah. I'm just going out of my world. <laughs> <laughs> In addition to that tuned up, hopped up little monster ZC, Ichishima also installed a close race gear transmission, which allowed the engine to stay in the optimal power band, which is important in a little engine like that, no matter what gear it was in. Final touch the now iconic yellow and blue spoon yes. livery. Oh, yeah. I love this car. Me too. They were in support of Ukraine way before. Way I before. Way. Yeah, cool. They saw it. With all the pieces in place, Spoon set their sporks on the 1988 <laughs> Japanese Corn <laughs> Car Championship. Now, it is worth noting here that Honda themselves had never entered a Civic into this race. Hmm. That is right. Ichishima beat them to the track with their own car. Wow. Honda took notice and decided to enter into an official partnership with Spoon Racing. This gave Ichishima the confidence to take Spoon to the next level. Dude, good on Honda for, like, mm -hmm. not just crushing them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just easy marketing. It's, it's easy like, marketing. Oh, these guys are already doing the work. Yeah. We'll put our name on it, too, and get some credit. In 1989, shouts to Taylor Swift, Spoon Sports began experimenting with the Honda Electronic Control Unit, which is the small computerized component responsible for calibrating a motor's air and fuel mixture. Yeah, so they took the ECU and were like, hey, start yeah, started messing with this. tuning yeah. it. Start tuning oh, there's ECUs. these new things called laptops. Let's use this. Decoding <laughs> the ECU would become the cornerstone of Spoon's tuning methodology. At a time when computers were becoming more and more prevalent in society, Spoon stood at the forefront with their precise calibrations. But Spoon still needed a victory under their belt. So they set their sights on the All Japan Grand Touring Car Championship, now known as Super GT, previously Ayo. known as JGTCC. Ichishima knew that placing in this race would make Spoon a force to be sporked with. <laughs> in the Japanese racing world. But in order to qualify for this race, the JGTC gave participants a restriction on engine size. Was that enough to stop Ichishima and Spoon? I think uh, maybe. Maybe. I uh, don't know. Guys. Guess I what? I don't know. Uh, Probably yes. No. Oh. Hell no. Dang, man. Yeah, put that in your spork and spork it. <laughs> <laughs> they took a Honda NSX nice. and gave it the full spoon treatment. Oh, I would dude, we should make a spork motorsport. I would drink an unhoused person's blood for this car. <laughs> <laughs> You're so careful about how you phrased it, but it's the most horrible thing. <laughs> yeah, this thing's pretty cool. Uh, I looked. I actually looked up the origin of hobo today, mm -hmm. and it's like surprisingly good. Not problematic. It's like homeward bound. Oh, or it, it, like it's uh, soldiers returning feeling. from civil war. I'm oh. on my way home, homeward bound. Or oh. uh, it was potentially like uh, a greeting between like travelers, like "ho b a b e a u ho bo," oh. like "hey man." After debuting at the JGTC, Spoon took their NSX to Macau to see how it handled on one of the most dangerous street courses in the world. Not only did they turn heads with their souped-up NSX, they also placed third in the race. Oh, That's podium, baby. Nice. This third-place victory at McCall solidified Spoon as a serious contender in the worldwide racing community. Heck yeah. So now we got Mugen and Spoon. Spoon and Mugen. Spoon and Mugen. Spoon, somewhat, Spoon and somewhat Mugen racing. Born, birthed from Mugen. Birthed. And now, you know, making yeah. their own wave. Yeah, it's like Mugen, F Honda. Honda begets Mugen, yep. Honda which begets, begets Mugen, Spoon. Yep. Begets Spoon. It's like the Bible. Yeah. Meanwhile, Mugen was also ready for the big leagues. And by that, we mean they were ready for Formula One. Nice. That's right, baby. 
Mugen built their first F1 race motor in 1991, in which they developed the Honda RA101E V10 engines for Terrell Racing. Those engines were handed over to Mugen the following year when Honda decided to develop a V12 engine instead. So, Mugen decided to try their hand at building an F1 engine of their own, and the result was the MF351H. This 3.5-liter 40-valve V10 was capable of generating over 700 Whoa. horsepower. And it was given to the Footwork and Lotus F1 teams. Fine. Lotus! Lotus, we're going to talk about them next week. That's right. Colin Chapman may have faked his death. May have. Hit that subscribe button. But this period of growth for Mugen wasn't without personal setbacks. On August 5th of 91, days before the Hungarian Grand Prix, Soichiro Honda passed away due to liver failure. Uh -huh. The news sent a shockwave through the automotive world. Hirotoshi Honda recalls the tumultuous time by saying his father was, quote, was a true fighter. He hated to be second and had to win. He always said shortly before his death, when Ayrton Senna could no longer win with McLaren Honda, my father complained about this situation from his hospital bed. He died on August 5th, 1991, and a few days later on the 11th, Ayrton won the Hungarian Grand Prix wearing a black band on his arm. When he heard the news, my family and I cried. Wow. It was shortly after Soichiro's death that Honda pulled out of Formula One, but Mugen continued to supply various teams for the rest of the decade. I did not know this at all. That is awesome. And while they were trying to keep their head above those choppy F1 waters, Mugen was also racing in the Japanese Touring Car Championship. In the JTC3 class where they were crushing, <laughs> Mugen Honda even won the 97 championship with a Mugen-built Honda Accord. That's, That's cool. dope. Nice. At the same time, Spoon was dealing with their own Honda-related setback. In 1997, Honda revealed the EK9, a.k.a. the Civic Type R. Yes. yes. <sighs> and they took it upon themselves to tune the Type R without any help from Spoon. Mm. The Type R was lighter than the original Civic and was designed for racing. This caught the attention of the racing world and especially Ichishima, who loved Honda but wasn't too crazy about them encroaching on his turf. Ichishima took matters into his own hands and started tinkering with the Type R. He made it even more lightweight. It weighed in at less than a ton. He fully balanced the engine, probably balancing that crankshaft, mm -hmm. I would assume, and gave the racer bigger brakes and a super aggressive camshaft. Blah, blah, this blah, is dope. Each Ashima's modifications brought his Type R up to 260 horsepower, which is 75 That is stock. insane for a naturally I aspirated four-cylinder. That is so nutty. The Type R was already the best Honda out there. It was the envy of the JDM-loving universe, but Spoon just made it better. I bet you have to, like, like not in a bad way, but I bet the maintenance on that is insane. Probably a lot, but yeah. You just got to, like, tighten. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In a similar move, when Honda unveiled the S2000, the S2K sports car in the late 90s, Ichishima went to work yet again. Spoon took the already sleek and fast S2000, modified the body, suspension, and the tuning to make them, you guessed it, even better. He sporked it up. Sporked it up, baby. And as a result, these Spoon Edition S2000s have become something of a collector's item. I, yeah, I bet. I bet. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, like, the regular S2000 revs to, like, 8,500, yeah. 9K, mm -hmm. uh, the Spoon one... 150,000 RPMs. <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. Amazing. <laughs> In the year 2000, Honda returned to Formula One. This put them in direct competition with Mugen, who had made a name for themselves during Honda's hiatus. Since Suichiro's retirement, the Honda leadership had been taken over by corporate managers who were not as fond of Hirotoshi or Mugen. Oh. As a result, Honda stopped supplying Mugen with engines in an attempt to weed out their biggest racing competitor. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> what a bad phone call. Yeah. <laughs> or email, if they were rude. <laughs> oh, hey, Honda. <laughs> uh, hey, Honda. Hope you're doing well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mugen decided to pull out of F1, but not without some notable accomplishments. During their nine-year stint, Mugen engines helped win four races Huh. And land 16 podium finishes. That's wow. all right. That's all right. I mean, I mean they're it's better than we could do, probably. <laughs> I would have, yeah. Probably. Yeah. If we had a bunch of money. How hard is it to hire good engineers? Yeah. Swag goes a long way in Formula One. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, Spoon was experiencing amazing growth. So much so, they had to open a new workshop across the street from their headquarters. 
This shop was dubbed Speed Shop Type 1, and they focused on installation and precision calibration. As Ichishima himself said, Type 1 is about the complete tuned car, not just individual parts thrown on without consideration or whether they will work in harmony or simply interfere with each other. That seems like a dig at someone. Uh, I don't know. This is a Probably tuned everyone. car. It's not just a bag of parts that someone not just, just a threw. bag of parts. Around this same time, Mugen would be hit with another devastating blow. On July 1st, 2003, Hiratoshi Honda was arrested for tax evasion oh. along with Mugen's auditor, Norio Hirokawa. The arrest came hours after prosecutors launched an investigation into Mugen for allegedly hiding $25 million of income wow. in a separate company and dodging $8.3 million in taxes. Hirotoshi denied the allegations. I apologize to the public for causing trouble, but I have never filled my own pockets. I have not been involved in the case. Hirotoshi felt it would be best for Mugen if he stepped down as president. Oh, man. It should be noted that Hiratoshi was finally acquitted of these charges in 2006, when but the boy damage charges. was done. On the spoon side, Ichishima had his sights set on their yet untapped American market. To build up hype, Spoon entered a JDM Accord into the first ever 25 hours of Thunder Hill endurance race in 2003. Nolan's cool. been to that. Yeah, we uh, won our class and got sixth place over. Wow. So cool, the Spoon Accord won in its E1 class mm. and placed 23rd overall. Nice. Not as good as Nolan. <laughs> wow. Yeah, hey. Will you build me a Honda? I'll try. You actually did, kind of. <laughs> Spoon had made its mark in the States, but they were not done yet. Americans were clamoring for more Spoons. Give me Spoons. Spoon, 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 yeah. spoon, spoon. We love that scene in the Matrix. <laughs> so in 2009, Spoon announced, along with their only U.S. representative, Go Tuning Unlimited, that they would begin a resto mod program where an existing American left hand drive NSX could be given a full spoon treatment. That's sick. Basically, that means someone in the US could take their NSX to Go Tuning Unlimited and they would add spoon suspension, brakes, carbon fiber bodywork, ECU <laughs> tuning, and even turbocharge it. That's sick. These basically became replicas of the Super GT cars Spoon built for Honda. Ah, oh, take me Love back. It. Take me <laughs> back. At the same time, Mugen needed a fresh image to distract from their ongoing legal troubles. They changed mm. their name to Spatula. So they changed their name to Psoon. <laughs> <laughs> it was at this point that Mugen decided to beef up their concept car program. Mugen concepts started popping up at shows all over the world. These custom builds gave Mugen a unique way to connect with their customers' base and drive people to their ever-evolving parts catalog. Sorry, for a sec, just the legal troubles thing and the fact that Hiratoshi was uh, acquitted. Yeah. That's actually pretty insane because I know Japan has like a extremely high conviction rate over there. Uh -huh. And they probably, I mean, even if uh, if they're going after you, you're, you're gonna get probably prosecuted. gonna be guilty. So the fact that he was acquitted mm -hmm. is huge. One such custom build was the 2006 Honda Civic Dominator, Ooh. revealed at the Tokyo Auto Salon. As Mugen says in its mission statement for the Dominator, the concept of this development is creation of the Supreme Civic, a concept car embodied by near future technologies we possess and we embrace. This beast has a K20 engine combined with a supercharger. Sick. De novo. Wow. Uh, made 300 horsepower. They also added flared wheel arches and a giant wing and uh, aggressive bodywork on the front. It looks like they shaved the rear door handles too, which is pretty cool to make it look like a two-door. The only That's thing I really don't like about it are the little fender flares. They kind of look like a Dodge Caliber to me. This is probably the only 2006 Civic I'd want to drive again. Because remember when we rode in that yeah, one? Yeah, they were. We, we didn't really like it. This is sick, though. 
Uh, this period was a time of growth and expansion for both companies, but they never lost sight of their original goals of precision tuning. Though their customer base was growing, Spoon and Mugen, Spoon and Mugen, Spoon and Mugen. maintained an independent <laughs> spirit that gave them a unique edge in the 21st century racing world. Awesome. But there's still more to come. Yeah, more to come. All... <laughs> Spoon me. If you're hiring for your business on your own, you're basically doing an LS engine swap into a 2004 Nissan 350Z entirely on your own. There's help out there. You don't need to bring that upon yourself. You just need to breathe, take it easy, and keep it simple. Because if you're hiring, you need Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. I can't even imagine going on different websites and sifting everything yourself. I can't imagine doing that when there's something like Indeed out there. One of the things I love about Indeed is that it makes hiring all in one place super easy. Their hiring platform itself is rock solid. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash past gas. Offer good for a limited time. That's right. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash past gas. Just go to Indeed.com slash past gas and support the show by saying you heard about it on this podcast. Indeed.com slash past gas. Terms and conditions apply. Imagine you make a job listing right after you listen to this episode and you hire your next great employee. That could happen. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Big thanks to Chime for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. You may think a credit score is no big deal, but if you're dealing with a low credit score or no credit score at all, that could be a problem for your future financial goals. That's why millions of people swear by Chime's secure credit builder, Visa Credit Card. Credit Builder is just a better way to build credit. You build your credit score safely with everyday purchases and on-time payments. Plus, there's no annual fee or credit check to get started. This is great for people just starting to build their credit. I was once there, I once had zero credit. But that's not all, you can get paid up to two days earlier with a qualifying direct deposit you can get access to your money sooner which is great if you're strapped for cash there's fee free overdraft with spot me this can save your butt if you spent too much in one month and you just need a little bit of extra wiggle room your credit score is a big deal so build up yours with chime just open a chime checking account with a 200 plus qualified direct deposit to get started and get started at chime.com gas that's chime.com gas the chime credit builder visa credit card is issued by stride bank na member fdic chime checking account and 200 dollars qualifying direct deposit required to apply out of network atm withdrawal fees may apply on time payment history may have a positive impact on your credit score late payment may negatively impact your credit score results May vary. Spoon hit the ground running in the 2010s with their now iconic FD2 Honda Civic Type R. This 2014 collaboration with Go Tuning Unlimited was probably the most famous for its unique centered driver's seat and steering column. Oh, you I remember about, this thing. Yeah, you know Dai this drives thing. this. Yes, Dai Yoshihara. It also My has best gear, friend, Dai. <laughs> so it has a gear shifter placed to either side of the oh, seat. Oh, I've done a video the, on this. Yeah, depending on the driver's preference. You did a video on this. Yeah. I've sat in this mug. This is crazy. Was it hard to get in? Uh, About, you know, you know, you ever been in a passenger seat and had to get into the driver's seat? Yeah. yeah. It's like that. Yeah. That's kind of hard. Mm -hmm. I think I might not be remembering. You might not be able to step on the floor. <laughs> In 2016, Mugen tapped back into their motocross roots and won the all-electric TT Zero motorcycle race with rider Bruce Ansi on the company's newly designed and fully electrical Mugen Shinden Go, which translates to God of Electricity Whoa. 5. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, yeah. God of Electricity 5. That's my new name. That's tight. This thing had a 160.9 horsepower motor, a carbon fiber uh, fairing, and a uniquely shaped monocoque frame. This is sick. In 2019, Mugen also unveiled the RC20 GT Concept Civic Type R. That's a lot of words. At the Tokyo Auto Salon. This aerodynamic Type R has a carbon-accented steering wheel. It has racing seats and a carbon fiber body made with weight reduction in mind, obviously. Mugen also gave it an open mouth fascia, which is a hallmark Mugen move. It has a vented hood and some other cool aerodynamic stuff. They also enhanced the aerodynamics, as I mentioned, uh, and cooling and power for good measure. And of course, Mugen threw in some sporty looking floor mats. You gotta have floor mats. James, you already you just bought some floor I mats. I just for bought your some car. nice floor mats for my car. Nice alpaca? No, cocoa mats. 
Mm. It's this attention to detail that keeps Mugen moving forward and why they continue to be the talk of auto shows around the world. I see the Mugen car over there. Both Spoon and Mugen have made unrivaled footprints for themselves in the tuning world. But both companies have indicated that they have no intentions of stopping, <gasps> even if Spoon brakes are sick. <laughs> Spoon and Mugen. Current Mugen president Tomoyuki Hashimoto is looking to the future of Mugen with optimism and pride. He recently said, Our philosophy has not changed since we started in 1973. We aspire to fulfill dreams while focusing on the future by constantly improving and investing in new products and technologies. That's like Chat GPT wrote on a president statement. Uh huh. <laughs> He currently hopes to expand Mugen's reach into the growing Chinese market. Interesting. No matter how challenging it is to expand into the Asian market, we will continue to move forward to bring our special and exciting products closer to customers and vehicle enthusiasts. Hirotoshi Honda himself believes that electric is the way of the future. The electric revolution is coming. Spoon has recently teamed up with Built by Legends to make the EG Civic hatchback. At $150,000, it's poised to be the most expensive hatchback in the world. Uh, though it has a high price tag, Spoon wanted to give members of the public the chance to own a piece of Spoon history. The design is a throwback to the 90s All Japan Grand Touring Car Championship racers from their humble beginnings, but with plenty of modern features to keep drivers happy. Huh, this is almost like... I mean, they're charging a huge amount of money for this thing. It's like, it feels like a like a singer type deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This consumer minded old meets new approach is what keeps Spoon at the forefront of the tuning world. Uh, wow, cool. Uh, so the story of Spoon and Mugen continues to evolve, and this is perhaps why these two companies were able to rise above the fray in the first place. Adaptability. The right tools can only get you so far in racing, but adaptability is the true key to survival. Much like the track itself, obstacles will present themselves, but being able to pivot is ultimately what gets the car to the finish line, literally and figuratively. Both yeah, of that's these a good metaphor for the <laughs> takeaway. Uh, both of these companies also have intentionally kept their staff small over the years. The white-gloved approach they began with is still very much in play today. Perhaps this principle is best illustrated by a quote from Hirotoshi Honda himself. Many people insist big is best. I believe they are wrong about that. If you want to stay efficient, don't grow. Monsters die. What? Wow. <laughs> Monsters Come on down to my world. Come on down to my world. <laughs> Come see my world. <laughs> Wow, uh, I love these companies even more Me now. Me too. So yeah. sick. Very cool. We got some cool listener mail this week from uh, Tyler. Go ahead and read it, Joe. How about uh, that? Tyler, the creator. That's What's cool. up, fellow D-holes? Hey. I haven't hey. heard that in a long time. We, we made a choice to not say that uh, three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a huge fan. I like fan. Gassers. Yeah, Gassers is cool. I've been a huge fan of the podcast. Came over from YouTube when you first launched the podcast and have listened to every episode. Thanks, man. Thanks, you guys dog. blend great storytelling and history lessons with good banter in between. I really oh, like our banter. Ah, uh, banter's my favorite. It really demonstrates the chemistry you have with, with each other. In the episode about Elaine Prost, James mentioned getting an Ayrton Senna tattoo. While I don't have any suggestions for a Senna tattoo, I thought I would tell you about how you guys inspired my first tattoo. Oh. Wow. I've always been a fan of car culture and motorsport as well as a fan of tattoos. Nice. Your first podcast series was on the Ford v. Ferrari rivalry, and I was so fascinated with it that I got a tattoo of the Shelby Cobra in honor of Carol Shelby, what? the cool. big chili man himself. I like that. Since then, I've always thought about if it would be cool for James, since he also has tattoos, to do a D-list type video of the best and worst car-related tattoos. I've done a lot of research on car tattoos, and there are for sure good ones and bad ones. Keep up the great podcasting. Keep it juiced, Tyler. Thanks, Tyler. My Thanks, favorite Tyler. car tattoo is, uh, when was it? A couple years ago, there's like a post where it's like, check out my new turbocharger tattoo, and it was like a really detailed alternator that this guy got. <laughs> oh, it was like really well done. That's uh -huh. cool. Uh, one of those like exploded image kind of ones? Sort of. It was it was just really detailed and funny. Um Honestly, could do like a tattoo artist's react to car tattoos or Less, something. Yeah, Real maybe. Stuff. Yeah. Um, I want to do uh, uh, like 
like famous racetracks from around the world encircling my most problematic moles. <laughs> <laughs> problematic as in like your moles say stuff they shouldn't say on air. Yeah. <laughs> they were recently pictured with Richard Spencer. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for your email, Tyler. Uh, if you want to email yeah. us, you can at passgas at donamedia.com. Uh, you can follow Nolan on socials at Nolan J. Sykes, Joe at Joe G. Weber, me at James Pumphrey, or on TikTok, uh, Kentucky Cobra. Follow Donut at Donut Media uh, everywhere. Check out our YouTube channel if you haven't already. Leave us a five star review. Tell your friends about the podcast if you like it. And most of all, see you. Come back next week because we're going to be talking about Colin Chapman, uh, his history with Lotus, and how he may have faked his own death. It's a great story. See you there.